you very much uh, for uh, inviting me and thank you to uh, Rob Galpin uh, who's uh, curating these talks uh, and uh, also to Karam and to the team at Tashkeel. I was actually uh, visited you um, uh, recently for the exhibition that you had there so uh, let's hope the border reopens between Saudi and the UAE so we can all get to travel back and forth again. Um, so uh, without uh, any further ado I'll just get on with sharing my screen and um, uh, present uh, my uh, presentation. If I can uh, find where we are, let's have a look. Yes, there we go. Uh, um, this is, uh, I'm talking about festivals and Biennale, the selection process. And uh, here's a sort of snapshot of some of, the, of two key projects I've worked on over the last few years. Noriad, which as mentioned, was launched in March this year. And I'll be talking a lot about Noriad uh, as a festival where we had 63 different artworks. Um, an exhibition and 33 artworks spread across eight locations across the city. So the top three images you see there are all from Noriad and the bottom right image is from the Noriad Light Upon Light exhibition. And uh, the two on the left of the bottom are both uh, from the London Design Biennale, which I was the director of in 2018. So these are the two key things I'm going to be talking about. And here's a, a list of what I'm talking about here. So uh, I'll give you an overview of Noriad and of the London Design Biennale. I'll look at themes, you know, the theme of uh, festivals and large scale events and, and uh, how we kind of arrive at those themes. I'll be talking a lot about curatorial planning, how we go about the planning process and of course, how we select artists and artworks. And um, throughout the talk and also at the end, I'll be talking about proposals and concept development and how you do that. Because I've seen from those of you who have joined uh, that there's at least one artist there, hopefully more. There's one artist that I recognise, but um, I'd like to thank you all for joining uh, me on this um, first Monday after Eid. And uh, there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. Uh, so uh, Noriad um, was uh, part, or is part of the Riyadh Art Project, which is a public art project launched in 2019 uh, by the Royal Commission for Riyadh City uh, as a public art project rolling out art, uh, a thousand artworks over the next six years uh, in the city of Riyadh, part of a, a kind of a, a, a much larger objective to make Riyadh a more livable city. And as part of that, they have an annual festival and it's a festival of light art and innovation. And uh, we uh, created this launch video, uh, we call it the ignition video. Unfortunately, you can find this on YouTube and I'm just going to run it now. Unfortunately, you won't get the sound through this Zoom link, but this will give you an overview, I think, of what Noriad as a festival was. You'll see the large scale, different uh, types of artworks and so on. So I'm just going to run this now and see if this uh, works okay. Okay, so that's uh, just a quick overview. You can see we had a whole range of works there from large scale sculptural to immersive installations to things on the top of big buildings, you know. And this is the essence really of creating a festival that, that spread across the whole city. Um, from the outset, um, when I came into uh, Noriad, um, I just want to, sorry, that's gone wrong there. Hang on. I just need to get to the next, uh, yeah. From the outset, I was keen uh, to make sure that as a festival, as a festival of light, we were also a festival of contemporary art. And one of the ways uh, we did that was by having an exhibition, which was independently curated by the curator uh, from the Guggenheim, Susan Davidson, uh, with uh, the Saudi curator, Rani Farsi. And this was the concept I had was 
to sort of have a cornerstone of the festival uh, that included great light art works, pioneering works uh, from the last 50 years. Because of course, many artists who work with light don't necessarily work in the public realm. They're, they're more, they're often working in galleries as gallery artists. Um, one of the reasons we did this as well is it enabled me to include artists like James Turrell as an artwork of his from about 20 years back that was included in the exhibition. And, um, you know, there's no way we would have had time to commission a new work by James Turrell uh, in the time we had available, but this was a way of bringing him into the festival in the terms of a, a lone artwork, in fact. And it also enabled us to go way back uh, to Lucia Fontana, one of the pioneers of the mid 20th century, and to, to bring some of the great artists also who worked in altering gallery spaces. Nancy Holt, who you see in the bottom left here, who also was a land artist as well as a kind of gallery artist. So this gives you an overview of some of those artworks that were in the Light Upon Light exhibition. And uh, I don't know why this is uh, not. There we go. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to be moving forward very well. And here are some other works, a great work by the great uh, American artist Mary Corse in the top left that you see there. And Dan Flavin, uh, who of course passed away a number of years ago, and we were able to have him part of the festival effectively by borrowing an artwork and including it in uh, the, the exhibition. And a whole range of different types of works were included. So this was uh, Noriad, uh, uh, a, a, an exhibition that was really a world-class exhibition that was uh, the kind of thing you might see at Tate or Guggenheim, um, alongside a, a citywide festival with artworks across eight different uh, locations, 33 artworks from 26 different uh, countries. Um, on to the London Design Biennale. Uh, this I ran for the 2018 edition, which is the second edition. And it's called the Biennale because it's modeling itself on the Venice Biennale with the idea that you have different pavilions that belong to different countries. And uh, here there's a sort of snapshot of some of the artists included. Flynn Torbot, who's an Australian artist. I'll show you this, uh, that work in more detail in a moment. Uh, Taban Lugu, architects from Turkey. Uh, and this was a piece that had already been exhibited. So, uh, you know, with a Biennale, you do, or any festival, you have the scope to exhibit works that have been previously exhibited. And I, I don't mind doing that as long as I have a sense of that, you know, you've got a good proportion of any festival or Biennale with new and newly commissioned works. Um, the work on the right is by Arthur Annalds, and you, you might recognize um, the UAE culture minister there, Nora al uh, who visited, and that's a, a drawing on this uh, wall, which um, was created by this Latvian artist, and it's a, uh, an installation that um, uh, creates condensation, and you can kind of write on it, and then your words disappear, and this won the Best Design Award at the Biennale that year. Um, the Biennale was held in Somerset House in London, and it's a neoclassical building from the late 18th century. So one of the challenges uh, for, for me as the director there and also the artistic director who I was working with was to find a work that would occupy the central courtyard space, which would be visited by a quarter of a million people uh, over the three weeks of the festival. And this work um, was by a Greek studio, Studio Inni, and it's a wall that you could kind of enter into. Um, in its static form, it kind of echoed the uh, classical architecture of the courtyard itself. So it had enough of a kind of sculptural presence uh, to hold the space. And this was certainly a challenge when we were working on the initial curatorial planning to find the right uh, piece for this uh, central space. One thing I noticed about it actually, though, when I was working on this is that, um, you know, it, um, we all live in this digital age, in the Instagram age, and it didn't always look great in photographs. I mean, this photograph maybe doesn't do it full justice. So what we actually did is we commissioned um, a choreographer from the Akram, uh, founder actually of the Akram Khan uh, Dance Company in London, and uh, uh, created a small sort of literally a three minute performance with, a, with one of his up and coming dancers to kind of animate the piece itself. So piece became about performance as well as purely sort of sculptural qualities. Um, this piece is by the Lebanese designer Natalie Harp and this is a piece that was recreated 
uh, for the London Design Biennale it had been previously exhibited in Beirut and it was called the Silent Room. Uh, so one of the things with, uh, you know, uh, the curatorial approach to uh, major events like this is you're also in the business of offering experiences as well as uh, simple sort of sculptural moments. And this was, I think, very much sort of feeding into the zeitgeist, really, of the idea of well-being. Uh, it offered a space which viewers could enter into and lie back and relax in. Uh, that offered si almost silence, not complete silence. It offered actually the sounds of recorded at 3 a.m. in Beirut, which was interesting. So it's a, a beautiful piece, I think, and a piece that looks interesting in its own right, but also offered an experience. This is one of the reasons why we felt it was a, a great offering for uh, the, the Lebanese offering for that year. And this is Flynn Talbot's piece, which um, the Biennale was created uh, and takes over the whole of Somerset House, which has a number of different rooms created at different times. And these vaulted rooms here, we had to find pieces that somehow worked with the space. And, and Flynn actually designed this piece, piece specifically. You can see the sort of curving forms of it echoing uh, the forms of the vaulted roof. Uh, we also had entries um, that were more exhibitions really than individual design pieces. This is by Mohammed Al Shahed and Zain Khalifa of Tintera uh, Studio. And uh, this was uh, like a mini, this actually won the best uh, pavilion award of that year, uh, judged by a, 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 a jury that includes a number of really high profile architects and, and curators. Um, and um, this was an exhibition that was exploring the kind of lost modernist history of architecture in, in Cairo and in Egypt. So it was a, a beautiful exhibition. And I think um, this is uh, one of the things that I had wanted to do as part of a kind of a, a strategy for the Biennale was to have an exhibition, just as they do in Venice, where you have a kind of an exhibition as an anchor, a curated exhibition, and then the individual pavilions. We weren't actually able to do that that year in 2018. And I don't think they were able to do it in the recent one either. But um, uh, it's um, one way of kind of uh, uh, getting around the curatorial issue of, of what you can and can't include. Um, and in a Biennale, as a curator or, or an artistic director, in some senses you have less control because you're basically offering the spaces uh, to individual countries. And the main objective really is to have as many countries as possible uh, represented. Um, and I looked to that and I was very keen to, um, to include, for example, countries from the Middle East. So I was able to bring in Qatar and the UAE. Um, I tried to bring in actually Palestine, but it was just very difficult in terms of the, the finances. So each participating country was uh, required to finance their own pavilion, both in terms of uh, rental and in terms of the not inconsiderable costs of, of bringing in uh, their designers or design groups. So sometimes design studios funded their own, but this was a, a beautiful uh, uh, part of the overall exhibition. It was one of my favorite uh, installations. This is uh, by Tinker Design Studios in Dubai. And uh, this was their installation. It had a pretty large space actually, and it, it was reflecting on the idea uh, of time as this whole uh, rack of, uh, uh, of um, hourglasses that turn, progressively turn. So you could hear the kind of mechanics of it this, uh, when you were there. It was very much a piece to be experienced in the space itself. Um, so coming on to the theme, uh, you'll see in a moment why some of those pieces there were there. Um, I'm just going to talk first of all about the theme for Noriad for the festival that we, we ran this year. We started to look at the theme uh, back in uh, 2019 when I joined the team. Um, initially, you know, you find a lot of um, arts festivals don't necessarily have a theme. Biennales do, but festivals don't. And we were kind of setting a marker by saying, look, with Noriad, we're going to have a theme, you know, because we're really a contemporary art festival. We're not just a light festival, as you find in a number of parts of the world. And uh, we workshopped these ideas. And the theme that I finally came up with was under one sky. And I had asked the question really of, you know, we were a light festival, a light art festival. And I asked the question, 
why do people look at light? You know, if you if you you see people, if it's a light art work, people gather around it. People gather around a fire. People gather under the stars. And I saw this as being and see this as being a universal human impulse. And so um, I felt that this theme was exactly what we were trying to do in Noriad. We were an international universal uh, festival. Yet at the same time, it has particular re resonance on the Arabian Peninsula uh, and the idea of the night sky out in the desert or the campfire in the desert. Tejmana uh, Sama Wahida, the latter of year, if I've got that right. Uh, and I quite liked the way that the translation into Arabic actually becomes a little bit more poetic. Um, you know, we originally had the translation as Tat Sama Wahida, which I think was a more literal translation, but the, the, we gave ourselves the kind of, uh, for those of you that speak Arabic, it kind of literally means more like it carries that sense of we gather uh, under one sky. Uh, so, um, as we reached out to artists for proposals, we found this was a very uh, powerful theme and it was very popular with artists and they really liked it and they responded in a number of different ways. So I really felt like, uh, you know, I got the theme uh, right for this and I'm still, you know, proud of this theme. And of course, not long after we'd created this theme, uh, you know, uh, what is it, end of January, beginning of February last year, then COVID came along. And what was incredible really was that how this theme suddenly seemed to speak to a sort of pandemic and post pandemic world. And the idea of togetherness being something really incredibly precious after we'd spent all that time in, in uh, you know, in, in isolation and in our own homes. Uh, so um, the theme, I think a good theme in any Biennale does uh, resonate in a number of different ways. And like any good work of art, it takes and gathers new meanings uh, and new resonances in time. Um, the theme for, for the London Design Biennale was uh, created by Christopher Turner, the uh, previous um, artistic director who uh, left in the summer of uh, 2017 uh, when, I, when I joined uh, and uh, towards the end of that year. And it was called Emotional States. And, you know, that theme very much speaks to I guess now, but also back uh, back then in 2017, 2018. And um, we looked at the different human emotions, the seven kind of codified human emotions. And we actually commissioned a, an artist who works in paper uh, to create uh, different faces based on different emotions, joy, anger, uh, fear. Uh, and this became part of our kind of uh, campaign um, with the Biennale, we had to be a little bit more flexible, really, in the terms of the way the theme was interpreted. But, uh, you know, in, in fact, most of the things that were made, some of them were, were very strongly directed and responded directly to the theme, others less so. Um, and um, so, I mean, uh, if you look at, say, the exhibition by, of the Egyptian Pavilion, not directly about emotions, but on the other hand, uh, ideas of nostalgia and memory uh, and modernism are all connected to different emotions. So we, the theme itself was flexible enough to be uh, looked at in a number of different ways. And I think we had the same with uh, the idea of Under One Sky. Many of the works uh, seem to be d a direct response to that. Others were perhaps more uh, peripheral or tangential. Um, so I want to go on now to the curatorial planning process and uh, what we do or what I do as I come on board for these kind of these large events. And with Noriad, uh, the first key concern was location. You know, we were putting on a, a, a citywide festival. Initially, it had been planned for just one small part of the city, much smaller than it, initially, it eventually became. So uh, back in November of 2019, I started to look around uh, potential sites and see what I felt. And one of the things with Riyadh, it's such a big city, you, you have to travel around it, drive around it really. Um, and so I was very keen to find a place where we could, uh, you could go park your car, walk around, you'd have an experience and, and put at least eight or maybe 10 artworks. And one of the places that seemed obvious was uh, the uh, it was CAF, the King Abdullah Financial District, and this is it. 
And, you know, when you go to a, a district like this, it, it provided a number of different squares and areas and buildings and things like that. And I guess the obvious thing would be to do something with this tall building here, the PIF building, the tallest one. But I looked at that and I preferred the one next to it, the uh, zebra building. So I thought it's a more interesting building. And also I could see it would work much better for uh, projection. Um, so this was the building that we selected in the end. And um, in CAFT, uh, we had a key kind of anchor work. So I think uh, this was by Daniel Buren, the great uh, French conceptual and installation artist, so, who uh, gave a proposal that was at once kind of simple but complex. And it was just, you know, in terms of execution, and cost, this is relatively simple. You know, we put these different colored films across uh, the triangular window shapes of this building by SOM Architects, the conference center at CAF. So this became an anchor work. And one of the things that I really liked about this work is it was designed to be seen during the day. So, you know, very few in a light festival, you know, very few of our works actually had were, were you know, viewable in, in the day in the same kind of way. We were a nighttime festival, really. But this one uh, brought the sunlight in, so you could walk into this building. There's a cinema there and so on. And this is where our exhibition was as well. During the daytime, these are two of my own photographs, actually. Um, you could see these beautiful reflections and colors that were ever changing. So it was very much about light. And then at night, um, you know, a very different feel, you know, it's shining outwards at night. So at night it becomes like a kind of beacon uh, for the whole festival. Um, this is the Zebra building. And um, one of the things I looked at, I looked at art uh, light festivals all over the world. And one of the things I noticed, and I mean, I went to some as well, the, the Fête des Lumières in Lyon, for example, is the biggest in Europe. And it's, it's basically full of video mapping. Um, so, you know, projections onto videos, the technology is getting easier. There's a lot of it around, a lot of um, uh, people. I mean, there's one in Sharjah actually, where it's almost entirely video mapping uh, um, and projections on building. I think you, some of you may have seen that if you're based in the UAE. So initially I was like, well, I actually don't want to do any projections on buildings at all. <laughs> but then I thought, well, look, I'll do things on buildings if people are doing something different. And uh, Daniel Kanoga, you know, I, I approached him. He'd already done really quite an interesting uh, one uh, on to the, um, uh, the Reina Sofia Museum in Madrid. He's a Spanish artist. And uh, he came up with a proposal for this building. I mean, we, we sent him the building spec, you know, and said, look, what do you think you can do with this? And he came up with this idea that um, he created lightning flashes on the building. So um, sometimes you'd be looking at it and you wouldn't see anything. And then a few seconds later, there'd be a small flash of lightning. Say, so, can you see my mouse, by the way, when I'm moving this? I don't know if you can see, you can see it, yes, yeah. So, you know, you might get a small flash across or one big flash running down. And what he actually did is he was uh, drawing real time data from thunderstorms all around the world and kind of crunching that data and then projecting it out onto the building. So um, what it, it was a really interesting work that was using data flow. And um, as we were developing that proposal, you know, I, I said to him, you know, uh, the problem is, you know, as a, as a curator, uh, artistic director, you have to think about the visitor experience. Uh, so, you know, an artist will want to do one thing and of course they want their work to be appreciated and understood by visitors, but the visitor experience is not first and foremost in an artist's mind. That has to be in the mind of the curator. Um, and so I was concerned that people would visit and they wouldn't see anything, you know? So I sort of said, look, you know, um, it's all very well drawing all this data from thunderstorms, but you know, what if there's no thunderstorm? And he said, well, at any one moment, apparently there's between two and 3000 thunderstorms in the world going on so like right now there's a thunderstorm somewhere it could be australia or it could be like europe somewhere uh, and so he was kind of bringing in all that data and crunching it and and it and this i mean this was the theme under one sky uh, so it was a wonderful uh, uh, you know use of kind of new technology 
technology, I think, with uh, uh, with uh, this idea of projecting. He used lasers in the end to actually project. Um, this is a work by uh, Lulu Al Hamoud, who I'd known from the London Design Biennale days, and uh, she created a wonderful um, installation there uh, for the Saudi Pavilion at uh, LDB 2018. Uh, so we'd approached her uh, with the idea of creating something new for Nouriad because her work is, her projected works are about light and she takes uh, simple geometrical elements uh, from Arabic script and they're crunched by algorithm uh, to create a kind of ever changing kind of immersive environment of changing geometries and shapes. Very, very beautiful. And she was very keen on creating an environment that you actually kind of walked into. And one of the challenges with this piece actually was to give it a kind of sculptural presence. So it kind of looked good on the outside as well as, well as on the inside. We couldn't just have any old kind of like structure. Uh, particularly where we were in Kaft, which is on the mosque plaza, which is what, right, you know, one of the main public areas of the uh, King Abdullah Financial District. Um, another location we chose as another hub location was the King Abdulaziz Historical Center. And uh, this has a number of renovated buildings as well as the National Museum. And uh, the piece, uh, one of the pieces that was placed there in this courtyard was a work by uh, the filmmaker Ayman Zadani, uh, a really interesting uh, and quite um, strange video work that plays out across three screens. This is actually a continuation of a video work that he uh, created for the 2139 um, exhibition uh, in Jeddah um, about two or three years ago. And um, this work is about some kind of it's science fiction, really. Uh, incidentally, he, um, if you're in Dubai, uh, he's got a work in the uh, Sustainability Pavilion. Uh, so he's one of the few Saudi artists there. So it's, it's worth having a look at when you go to Expo. Um, so he creates these works about a kind of distant, uh, imagined future. And this, there's always a bit of humor involved in his work as well. So. In the early conversations I had to, with him, I sort of said, look, you know, we, I definitely want to do this because the film is light, but, you know, I have to somehow tie it into the idea of a light festival. And he said, don't worry, I've got some glowing camels in the film. So he has these, these futuristic glowing camels that glow kind of pink, and so they're giving off this light. So over tenuous, that might have seemed to, as a connection. Then we decided, you know, this really did work with the festival. And it was wonderful to see the kind of baffled and intrigued responses by visitors as they were watching his film because it's a uh, his his films are are you know they're, they're science fiction but based on ideas of a very very distant past and a very very distant future um also in the uh, historical center this is the roof of the national museum and uh i was keen to have another filmmaker i, I felt that film was an important part of uh, of the idea of light. I mean, film is light. So I wanted to have some film works and it was just a question of how and who to ask to do this. So, you know, we had really two of the key Saudi artists working in film, Ayman and uh, Mara on the gate. And uh, she created this incredible piece that was really poetry of three separate films uh, that um, were, uh, had protagonists and poems in Tagalog uh, with Filipino, uh, in Pashto with uh, with an Afghan uh, in Arabic and then and then also in English and this was projected onto this screen of water um, that was on top of the National Museum so in some ways um, as an artist is quite a challenging and brave thing to do I think to to place these huge uh, speaking figures uh, speaking poetry in their own languages on top of the Saudi National Museum. But this is in an area where actually quite a lot of immigrants live. So, you know, there is there, there is a Filipino community there, there's an Afghan community uh, very close to this historical center here. So we were speaking here, I think, to a very different audience with a very powerful artwork. Um, we had to, uh, you know, the, the Kingdom Tower is the tallest building in Riyadh. It's, it's, a, it's a symbol really of the city. Um, and it has previously been 
used for put video mapping with uh, national day celebrations and so on. So I kind of felt we can't avoid having the Kingdom Tower in some way or another. Uh, but it was quite a challenge to find the kind of the right kind of work. Uh, and this was proposed by a Belgian artist, Kurt Vermeulen, which is a, this kind of jewel like uh, star right in the middle, suspended right in the middle of uh, the Kingdom Tower. Um, various technical assessments and, and uh, people kind of told us, no, you just can't do this, it's impossible. <laughs> but actually, when someone tells me that, I kind of get more determined to find a way around it. And, uh, you know, with the right engineers in place and, uh, you know, with the artists working and recommending, uh, they came up with this idea of actually suspending this uh, object from, from this tower, which is over 300 meters high. And so I really like the idea of having a piece that um, could be visible across the whole of the city, like a symbol. And what was interesting about this piece as well is that, you know, as we put it up there before we turned the thing on, you know, there was a huge amount of speculation on the, on social media as to what this thing actually was, but people just didn't have a clue. And then of course we had to do the testing and the testing we just did at like kind of four o'clock in the morning, hoping that not that many people would see, but sure enough, there were a few people who saw it and then it got leaked onto social media and so on. Um, we also had, uh, you know, another iconic building of uh, Riyadh is the UNESCO World Heritage Site at Atareif. And this is the facade of Sawa Palace. And the artist who uh, came up with the proposal for this was Robert Wilson, who is a choreographer, scenographer. He's had a long, long career um, in the performing arts. Um, in creating extraordinary stage sets and, and also co-writing, for example, he's the co-writer uh, of the famous Philip Glass opera, Einstein on the Beach, 1974. And uh, what he did is, um, it was interesting working with him actually, because um, we never quite knew what we were going to get, you know, you know it's one of these things where as an artistic director, you have to sort of hold your nerve and trust that what he will come up with uh, will be brilliant, and it was brilliant. Um, and I think this could have only come uh, from a scenographer and, uh, and an artist who spent a lifetime working in the performing arts. He treated the whole building as a stage. He created this kind of strange sculptural work that's like a sort of glowing sun. And then this silver shore here, and then projected the sea uh, onto the facade of this building. And it was an incredibly moving and emotional work, I think, because it had. Uh, it, it was, you know, I mean, this Riyadh once was a sea, you know, millions of years ago, but it's now kind of landlocked, you know, by hundreds of miles of desert all around. So to bring the sea there to this historic building uh, with also a kind of opera soundtrack accompanying, it was, it was an incredible artwork um, and one of the highlights, I think, of the whole festival. But it was a it was a challenge to find something that would work in in this environment, not least because it's a UNESCO heritage site. So we were very limited to what we could actually do there. Um, but we came up with a solution that used some existing projectors that they had there as well. Um, one of the I was very keen from the outset to use some of the kind of natural environments around Riyadh. And this is Wadi Namar in the south of the city, where you actually have water and these uh, incredible cliffs in the wadi and uh, the work you see here is by a Swedish artist, Alexandra Stratimirovic. And um, this piece had actually been exhibited in cities before, but I like the idea of it, um, you know, being somewhere where it could be reflected um, in the water, which is what you see here. And the main kind of public promenade area is where you're, you're getting this view from on the other side. So it's not so much of a public area where the, the piece is situated. So you can see it from, from a distance. So this was very much part of the process. You know, it's a bit like having a big puzzle and deciding what goes where. And um, at one point we were looking at having a number of other works around this area. We had one more that's kind of floating in the, in, in the water. But in the end, um, one of the tricky things with light art is that uh, it can lose its impact if there's more than one artwork. So I was keen from the outset in curatorial planning to, to try to have the individual works speak for themselves. And for even in the hub areas where we had, say, several works, 
in the historical center and in, in, in the financial district, we had you know eight to 10 works in each of those locations. But I was keen to make sure that they were not, uh, there were no sight lines between the individual works. Because I think uh, for many light artists, the encounter with the artwork needs to be a, uh, a almost a kind of mystical one. So, um, and, uh, you know, we also put um, some artworks in, in shopping malls. Um, and this is a work by the German artist Christopher Bauder. It's an installation piece that actually takes, it's like a mini performance of about sort of like 20 minutes where uh, you're, it's an immersive performance, but you need an indoor space for this. And this was one of the challenges with Noriad because we were essentially, we were an outdoor festival, but there were some, I did want to have some indoor experiences. And these, uh, this work operates with these uh, mirrors kind of like uh, moving up and down and, and, and choreographed in a very interesting and sophisticated way. And, and this was in a shopping mall, you know, so uh, it, it's in a mall called Riyadh Front, and this was really the only suitable space for it. Um, I just wanted to go on to uh, selection criteria. Um, and I'll, I'll come back, I'll keep going by the way, but if you do have questions on anything I've discussed so far, then I, we can always come back to, to it. And I, I just wanted to um, share, these are our selection criteria from Noor Riyadh. Um, so um, when we were looking for art and artworks, we had certain criteria that, you know, they had, the artist had an artworks proposed had to kind of meet these these criteria. So the project vision, you know, the festival was part of the wider Riyadh art project. So they had to feel like they kind of aligned with a wider public art project, which most of the artworks did, you know, we weren't really rejecting anyone on that basis, but this was one of our criteria. Uh, of course, we look at artists standing um, by that we mean, uh, you know, artist experience, uh, their profile, their what they've done already. Um, we were looking at having a mix of artists from emerging artists uh, through to kind of your mid ranking, if you like, artists uh, through to ones that are seen as being, you know, the top uh, artists in the world, uh, you know, an artist like Daniel Buren and um, Bob Wilson, artists who are, you know, regularly seen as being in the top kind of thousand internationally. So it was important to have a mix of that. Uh, one of the things uh, with emerging artists, it's always great to give emerging artists an opportunity, but in some cases, it's a big challenge for an artist who's worked on a smaller scale to scale up their work and to be able to respond uh, and create something uh, for uh, the, the much larger spaces that you have in a festival. Um, artistic integrity, this is really originality, you know, and the integrity of the artist. And so um, we, we were always looking for original pieces, original pieces by the artists. Um, then we had um, the uh, curatorial relevance, um, and this was, you know, how well does it match the, the theme? And, you know, we did have proposals from really quite high ranking artists, you know, some artists who are really some of the best in the world. And I actually rejected some of these. And I, I was thinking at the time, you know, my God, well, I'm, I'm rejecting, you know, artists who have had a 40 year career uh, and who, you know, artists I very much admire, but their work simply didn't quite fit. So uh, into what we were trying to do with Under One Sky, with a light art festival and all these things. So we had to kind of go back uh, to curators and artists sometimes and say, oh, sorry, this is not quite right. We need something a little bit different here. Uh, and generally there was an understanding of that. One of the challenges we had with COVID uh, was that we simply were not able to have as many artists on site visits as we'd hoped to, because you know, in a, in a public art setting, it's really important for an artist to know and understand the site and understand the city. And unfortunately, that's one of the things we couldn't do. So it was quite, quite a challenge actually to, to operate without, you know, with artists who were just like on Zoom calls with technical teams and so on. Um, I mean, criteria, light as medium, obviously that was for the Noriad Festival, that wouldn't be a criteria. Um, for loaned artworks, particularly in the exhibition, we were keen to check on provenance and where they had actually come for, from. Uh, representation, this was about the idea that um, the artworks also did need to speak to the communities of Riyadh. Um, they needed to speak uh, in Saudi as well as an international context. Due to COVID, we actually had kind of 
percent of our visitors were Saudi, you know, uh, a much higher percentage than we expected. We would have expected actually to have had a lot for people from the UAE was, was part of the original plan. Obviously that didn't happen. Uh, so we were keen to, I mean, we made sure in the selection that we had uh, a good balance between Saudi and international artists, but regional Saudi and international. Uh, we had around about 40% Saudi in the end, uh, which I'm proud of. And it was important to me as well, you know, not to just sort of have the Saudis in one bit and then the international in another, you know, we could have quite easily fallen into the trap of having you know, all the international contemporary artists in the contemporary part, which was the financial district, and then all the Saudis in the historical center. And that, that wasn't what we wanted to do. We wanted to have a, a, a balance and to, to keep a kind of uh, a sense of uh, equality across uh, the whole of the festival. I think we, we achieved that. Um, one key part, if you are an artist or a designer, is that, you know, the, the safety of the artwork is really important. Um, and that's one of the things that when we come to concept development and proposed development that, that we're often looking at what can be done. And there's a new dimension now, uh, which is safety around COVID. So, you know, I mean, looking at that work by Arthur Hanouts, Latvian, you know, the green wall and thinking, you know, would that be even allowed today? Would you have to put a pair of gloves on or something like that? So unfortunately, COVID's added additional challenges in terms of what you can and can't do. Uh, with um, with proposals, but the artwork needs to be safe. It needs to be uh, so, and this applies whether you're creating a big stone sculpture or or a, a contemporary light artwork. You know, it has to be something that uh, that is checked and signed off by health and safety. Uh, just uh, briefly to kind of um, uh, conclude, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, proposals and concept development, um, and. Um, I'll share um, one work. Um, these uh, two images here come from a proposal uh, received by Karolina Halatek. Uh, she's a Polish artist and she's done a number of works with light here that are very interesting works. She's quite interested actually in the ideas of life and death. And so she's created immersive works and works that are like a kind of tunnel. And so I'd looked at her work and I'd like what she did and you know reached out to her for proposals and, and she came back with uh, always very professional proposals and, and if you asked her for a render she would give one to you so you know if you are an artist or a designer i know this takes resource and you know you might be able to do them yourself or not and if you can't yourself i know they can cost money but um it really was helpful to me as the artistic director to have different options on the rendering and when i first looked at her proposal this artwork called Beacon, which is, you, I'll show you the picture in a moment of the final artwork. You know, I, I love this piece because it, it worked as what it said, like a beacon, uh, you know, it's, it's tall, pretty tall, um, I forget the exact height, but you can see it's like three times the height, you know, of a human there, it's sort of like six or seven meters high. Um, but you could also kind of step inside it and have an experience, so it kind of offered they're both those things, something that has a, had a real sculptural presence. And so I'd been walking around CAFT, the financial district, and then I found this kind of space here. And I, I really loved the idea of using this space. You kind of walk down here. It wasn't yet in, you know, ready for the public, but, um, uh, and you can just see actually, this is part of the zebra building, I think in the background here, or maybe that's it here actually. Anyway, um, but I was looking at it and the more and more I walked around it, I kind of thought this work actually is going to get lost in the financial district. You know, the financial district's already got lots of interesting architecture and lots of interesting kind of geometrical shapes. And I'm just putting another one in there. Um, and I'd originally liked the idea of, you know, seeing it kind of poking up from this subterranean level because the top just got up to ground level and above. But then I thought, no, so I actually sent her some pictures of the wadi and I said, look, I think we're going to move you out to the wadi. And I, I, what I really liked was the idea that, you know, you're walking in this kind of natural landscape with the trees and the rocks and the water, and then you come across this thing you know, and it's like, what is this? You know, it looks like it could have been planted there by aliens or something. So I loved that kind of idea. And so Carolina kindly provided a, a, another kind of a render that was the one you see on the left here. 
But then we were looking into, and this is one of the things that you have to do, is to look into simple uh, facts of visitors and parking and uh, crowd control and, and how people get there. And we just felt that putting it in its distant location, it might not get the right kind of audience it really needed. Um, and, you know, there were also some practical considerations like um, how to control people going in and out and so on and guarding it at night and stuff like that. So in the end, we decided to move to the historical center where there was a natural setting similar to this, but in a park very close to the National Library that I showed you earlier. And so that's where we, we kind of moved it back to that. And this is uh, the final kind of iteration of it. Um, we altered it slightly. This is a, a fog machine that she, she uh, brought. So. Um, we had two fog machines running, so give it more of a kind of a mystery. And we did actually have to alter it slightly because of COVID regulations around air circulation. Uh, so the the uh, the diodes were put slightly further apart. So this is, you know, a piece that really was fairly true to its original concept, but but we had to be changed and altered ever so slightly. And uh, one of the things as well is that as the festival, we were very keen on accessibility so I wanted all everything to be uh, we use the American uh, system of um, uh, disability access it's the, called the AAD I think it is um, you know there are a number of different um, uh, ways of um, working on that um, and so I was keen for this piece also to be accessible for for people in wheelchairs and uh, but then of course we didn't want to change the kind of look of the piece as you're looking at it now. Uh, so uh, my simple suggestion on this is uh, there was lots of discussion about what, what can we do around the steps here. I said, we'll just create a wooden ramp, something that you can just remove easily. And then uh, and then if a disabled person uh, arrives, you know, we can just simply, we had the team there, just put the ramp in place and they could just go up the ramp and just enjoy it the same as everybody else. So that was our, our simple solution uh, for that one. Um, so, um, I think um, I've kind of covered most of what I would uh, want to cover. Um, just um, to come back to the idea of kind of proposals, you know. Oh, I, I can actually just, I haven't mentioned this because this is uh, Mohanad Shonov, uh, who's the Saudi artist um, whose work I really like. And this is a work that, you know, initially I, I'd spoken to him and was in his studio back in, I think, December 2019 and he said I want to do something about uh, this and he picked up a, a ball of uh, wire wool and set fire to it and I don't know if you've ever seen wire wool burn it kind of glows in a really strange kind of way and essentially that was his starting point for this work uh, and uh, the piece actually this huge installation was originally going to be one of three installations in this space, which is a purpose built, it's a converted uh, factory uh, called Jack's uh, on the outskirts of uh, Riyadh. And there were going to be three pieces here, you know, and uh, as I saw the kind of development of uh, Mohanad's work, I mean, at one point he was looking at creating a big kind of spaceship like structure that was going to hang from one of the bridges uh, in Riyadh. Uh, but then we kind of went back to this idea of this strange landscape that kind of glows as if it's sort of on fire with um, this um, what he called the mind ship which is um, this here this broken up ship ship across this uh, strange kind of landscape that was made from recycled tires so you know there's a material that's made out of recycled tires that they actually burn for in biomass generators and so um, Mohanad literally acquired tons of this stuff and then created this installation here. And so as the work kind of developed, as the concept developed, and he kept us regularly up to date with kind of where he was going with it, I really felt that he needed the whole of this space. You know, there's not many artists that can kind of handle and hold a very, very large space, but it seemed to me that the piece was trying to give uh, the viewer some kind of a sort of mystical experience akin to say the experience of the human relation that we have with fire uh, and uh, like Ayman Zidani interestingly it's about some kind of distant 
future of some kind. Some there's a sort of science fiction element uh, to this, and um, so I felt he needed the whole space. So this caused a few problems actually in terms of having to relocate some of the artists that uh, were originally intended to be there. But it seemed to me that just to go in and see them hand shown or come out, go into another one, then out and into another one, it wasn't really going to work in this actual space. He needed the whole of the space, and I think he really. Uh, rose to the occasion on that. Um, so this, this is a work that had a number of different iterations, even after the only opening of the festival. Um, as a, a number, uh, you know, at one point there was a plan to have a sort of path in through the middle. Um, and I quite liked that idea, but he had tried it out and the artist sort of felt no, it somehow cheapened the work. And I think, I think it was probably right on that. Uh, and you could go up to the upper level and, and, and view this from, from above as well. So um, that's the end of my uh, presentation. I'll um, stop the share for a moment, but we can always come back to it um, if, uh, if you'd like to. And I think we're probably open uh, for some questions now. Is that, uh, is that right, Hiba? Thank you, Sumi, for this. It was really inspiring to just see how your your brain works in relation to all these like different factors of like intervening with the city or intervening with the artists and working with them and developing their projects and also looking at like this idea of no like access like accessing these like works of art throughout the city and what kind of access do you provide them when you're curating these works so um, shall we open it to questions and then maybe I can also ask a few questions myself as well. Um, we already do have a question and it says, do you see environmental sustainability as a criteria that is growing in importance? For example, when it comes to production, transportation, installation, public display, as well as a works afterlife. Yeah, I, I think it's really, really important. And as a matter of fact, one of the first things I did on joining Norriad is I actually wrote our own uh, environmental policy, uh, yeah. which we just about managed to stick to. I mean, in a light festival, um, you're obviously using power. And uh, some of my initial conversations actually are with an incredible uh, group um, uh, based in Seattle, um, uh, Robert Ferry, Ferry and Elizabeth Monahan. Um, and uh, they run the Land Art Generator Project. They've actually been in Abu Dhabi uh, and they create public art that is also, or they run competitions to source public art that is also uh, uh, power generators. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, that was an ambition uh, early on to have sort of one artwork that would generate power for the whole of the festival. Uh, we didn't achieve that for this year's festival, but I think it is something that is still under consider, consideration for the future. In actual fact, um, in terms of the power used by uh, light art works, it's pretty low power these days, actually. So it's, uh, it's not as significant. Um, what is significant is moving things and people around the world. Yeah. Uh, and that's always a dilemma for an international festival. Because, you know, part of the beauty of an international festival is it's about cultural cooperation. It's about understanding between cultures. It's about people discovering new places. And I think in the case of Saudi Arabia, that's particularly important because of perceptions of what Saudi is outside of Saudi Arabia are so kind of distorted where you actually have this incredible country with an amazing new generation of artists coming up. Those artists, you talk to any of those artists, they, they want international artists to come and be there and participate. Obviously, every time someone comes, that's another flight, that's more carbon in the atmosphere. So I think it's a dilemma, and I think it's a dilemma probably for all of us that work in the arts, you know. Um, but I would say uh, in defense of what we do as in terms of large scale festivals or large scale events, I, I would say, the arts is still probably not as big a, you know, uh, generator as carbon as, say, sports or, or other activities, other kind of international activities and gatherings. So I'm, I'm in favour of them still carrying on. Um, so, um, but I don't know if that answers the question. I think the, the way forward is to look carefully at what the overall carbon footprint is. We recycled as much as we could. 
um, mm. and uh, our operations manager, Yasmin Sabri, she's very, very much also is very keen on that. And she actually worked quite hard off her own back to, uh, to make sure that a lot of the materials used were recycled. In some cases, we're using pieces that have already been exhibited. So we're just kind of like uh, shipping them. The shipping, of course, costs money, you know, mm. uh, and costs is environmentally. Uh, but it's it, it's like a lot of international activity, you know, like international music events, for example. They yeah. also have a carbon footprint. So I, I think we all do have a responsibility there. I, I certainly do. What about this idea of like the afterlife of work? Well, all of the um, newly commissioned work uh, that we have um, in uh, uh, that we had in Noriad is going to find a life somewhere else. And uh, in fact, some of the works are likely to be commissioned by the Riyadh Art Project itself. Yeah. Uh, and um, the others will uh, hopefully appear in other places. And so you know, some of these light artworks, they, they're kind of seen in different part, places around the world, you know, as in yeah. the Alexandra Stratomirovich piece, for example, you know, that yeah. had always, always already been exhibited. So yeah. I think a future life is important. And one of the things um, I've also done actually is already kind of spoken to other institutions uh, like Art Jamil uh, and um, Ithra in Eastern Province uh, and even Asakal Avenue in Dubai. So I've spoken to them and Hayward Gallery in London actually about ideas of co-commissioning in the future. So I think that's oh, okay. one of the ways forward. So, uh, you know, to have what works. Um, one of the things I was quite keen on keen on, uh, particularly when talking to kind of Hayward Gallery London was the idea that actually these will be works originating in Saudi and then traveling to London rather than the other, the other direction. Because I think it's important now uh, mm -hmm. for this region to start, you know, re really asserting its own voice uh, mm -hmm. and creativity in the arts. Mm -hmm. um, there are a few other questions, which I'm going to read uh, maybe few of them. So thank you for the very interesting presentation. How do you make art more accessible to the different disabilities? Yeah, it's a really good question. And, and one of the things I'm really proud of uh, what we did or the, the team achieved on this is that uh, we actually worked with two charities in Saudi Arabia. And one of the charities we worked with was a charity for the blind and visually impaired. And you might think well, you know, a light festival for blind people. What's the point of that? But actually, you know, we, we worked and we uh, had um, guides uh, from this organization that we worked with who actually did uh, visually described tours around the exhibition. We had volunteers who were uh, blind or visually impaired. Uh, so we really opened it up to, to uh, that group of people. Um, we also worked with the Saudi Autistic Society uh, as well, and we ran special uh, visits for them because there are certain sensitivities around light and flashing lights for autistic people. Uh, so we had to kind of like um, uh, work with them for their advice on how we make it more accessible. So as a, a curator and artistic director, you know, one of the ways to do this is to actually reach out to the experts. You know, I don't know on the specific needs, for example, of a, of a visually impaired person around the light festival, but I reached out to the charity that works on that and they're usually more than happy to be involved yeah. and so that's that's uh so i think i think uh, we set a benchmark that in in, in Noriad actually by 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 making a point that we're going to be inclusive in that way yeah yeah i mean you spoke a lot about this idea of like scale and like bigness and we know a lot of these works that you're working with are are being uh, displayed in cities in the GCT that we know the scale is so huge in relation to human scale. So I wonder, I mean, and also like kind of thinking about Bruce Mao and like his idea of small, medium, large, extra large, or even Ram Kulhas with his notions of bigness. I wonder how would you kind of define scale? Because you, you also, uh, through your presentation, you were talking, not any artist could like scale up. So I'm just curious about how you would kind of formulate that scaling up or scaling down? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really interesting question because I, I think there is a tendency uh, in particular um, towards, um, you know, some of these festivals, the kind of leadership above the festival to sort of want bigger and better. And I think that's a tendency you see everywhere across the world. 
uh, and I was keen actually not to, to have just the big pieces. You know, I mean, you do need the big pieces. You 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 can't get away from it. You know, that, that, as I said, with the Kingdom Tower, I couldn't not have a piece on top of that tower. You know, it's the iconic building in the whole of Riyadh. You're a citywide festival. How do you leave it out? So it was important to do that. But I, I also wanted there to be a sense of uh, discovery to the artworks and a sense that you might find smaller things in, in places. And I think we did achieve that. Perhaps I should have included one or two of those works, um, the, the smaller pieces. Um, and um, uh, it's something that we're working towards for the next festival as well, because I think sometimes you can have things also, things that are repeated around the city. You know, little little, uh, little things that you might discover, and uh, uh, that's certainly. I think it is important because as big is not always better. Yeah, uh, exactly. but uh, yeah, but you know, one of the challenges uh, we had really is that you know we're working with a diverse range of, of artistic approaches here. So you know, you've got the projected works, and uh, as I said originally, I didn't really want to do projections, um, but. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Iman, uh, one of our uh, curators, she um, curated the Saudi works and she came up with this idea of actually projecting pioneering Saudi artworks onto the two buildings, the, the National Library and uh, the Masmak Fort. And so this is a brilliant way, I thought, of dealing with the idea of projection because it can become too kind of cliché. So we had projected works, then we had, had your kind of architectural intervention. Then we had the kind of medium and large scale sculptural works as well. And then we had the works that were more immersive in installation. So there's a whole range of different artworks to work with. And, and part of the job as an artistic director, when you're also working with curators who are kind of sub curating their sections, is uh, one of the challenges also is to kind of have a nice range, but have to have a nice range, but also one that feels coherent. Because yeah. you can't just sort of say, right, I'm going to have one of each, you know, <laughs> that one projection, one of this, one of this. So yeah. um, it's uh, it's certainly a challenge, and it's a challenge is what you leave out as well. So, you know, part of what, you know, it's, it's always difficult to let things go, particularly works that you really wanted. I mean, there was one or two artworks that I really wanted in, in the festival this year, but, but we just, for all kinds of reasons to do with location, to do with cost, to do with availability, we weren't able to keep them all, um, and yeah. so uh, so that's that's a challenge as well. And that, we yeah. had the same thing with the London Design Biennale. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, it, it actually also ties into to uh, into something that you said now and before this idea of like creating experiences rather than just moments, sculptural moments. And when you're like describing this, like this idea of how to work with the different works of different scales, like it feels like an orchestration, like a kind of a, 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 a musical orchestration of different works. And I wonder if you could speak more towards this idea of experience, especially in a world that's so like heightened, uh, commercially heightened, globalized, like what kind of experience are we looking for in like works of art? Uh, regardless of scale? Well, I, I mean, I think, um, uh, you know, um, people have always had experiences encountering artworks. It's mm. just they perhaps become more sophisticated and more varied. Mm. And um, I was, I'm always conscious, you know, everything I've done in my career has been about actually audiences and what the audience response is. So I'm always conscious of that. Uh, I'm, I'm a great believer in art, not being necessarily too easy. So there are some kind of quite complex experiences that people might not quite get or might be baffled by. Um, but I, I also think that with a festival, and this applied with uh, the London Design Biennale as well, there has to be an element of fun. So yeah. you know, we had we had some artworks that really were quite light, you know, that were quite, um, uh, you know, we worked with a, uh, an organization called the Light Art Collection, which is um, from the Amsterdam uh, light festival and a lot of their works were more on shall we say the fun side they're not necessarily about uh, a contemporary art so they're not um perhaps you know they don't have artists like Ahmed Mata who whose work is, is is always exploring ideas of existence uh and and uh, and energy and power and god and you know these kind of themes that resonate around an artist like him uh, you don't necessarily get that with some of these festival artworks, which are just, uh, if you like, kind of lighter. Um, yeah. But I think there's room for all of those in, in a festival. And, and I think yeah, it's, it's about trying to get the, 
the balance right. I mean, sometimes I have a gut feeling what I do and don't want to do. And so we had some proposals, for example, that included swans, like these kind of glowing swans. Yeah. And there were also some uh, butterflies, I think, that had been exhibited in Amsterdam. And I think I, I said fairly early on, look, no swans, no butterflies. This is really <laughs> outright. <laughs> you know? I mean, if I'd been like in London by the River Thames, yes, swans, fine, let's do that. But, you know, there, there were kind of elements that I felt needed to be part of the city. And I think one yeah. of the things we, we did do with Riyadh is, uh, we, with Noriad is we created a kind of festival of the city and for the city. Yeah. And that was uh, in part due to this, great input that we had from both curators and Saudi artists who really knew the city. I mean, we had a beautiful artwork by uh, a young artist called Najud al Sideri, where she actually asked people to write love letters to the city of Riyadh. Wow. Uh, and uh, they then, that then became a kind of an installation that was also a cafe with the, with these kind of fragments uh, written onto coffee cups that you then, uh, uh, so it was a very socially engaged artwork. So. Uh, and and there, I, I, I was very keen to have that as part of our festival, because although it didn't have an obvious initial kind of visual impact, so that was one of the ones that, you know, some of the artworks, shall we say, are perhaps sometimes harder to get past your leadership in terms of, it, you know, it's quite easy to show that big star at the top of the, uh, you know, there yeah. you can see this is spectacular. I've got it straight away. Yeah. It's easy. Yeah. Um, it has an immediate visual impact, but not everything has an immediate visual impact. And so, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah I think. Um, um, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, you know, if anyone, uh, you know, uh, if we, you have are, of, we have a lot of images, so I'm just going to read them through. So, Jihan Ali yeah. says, so beautiful. I loved all the fluttering, flashing, reflecting, glowing, and guiding lights. Rima Kahal says, as an artist, what we need to take into consideration when applying and who is eligible to submit? How do you choose your artists? Yeah, so um, in the case of Noria, there's a very specific process that, that we go through, which is the actual artists are proposed as selections of uh, bidders. So the uh, contractors have the contractual relationship with the artist. So uh, there'll be three of these uh, proposals going out. Um, and what happens is that people who are bidding approach artists individually. And in, uh, they want um, kind of clear proposals of what they could and couldn't do. So, you know, for me, if I, and, you know, I will then be looking at the overall, you know, one of the contractors will win. Yeah. And, and I don't mind, uh, sometimes contractors uh, who are, asking artists to take part in something as part of a proposal. We'll say, look, you have to be part of this and you can't be part of anything else. Uh, that's not actually true. So if you're an artist and you get approached by three different or five different contractors who say, look, we're bidding for this work for Noria 2022, uh, then there's nothing wrong with putting your proposal into more than one of those, uh, those companies. Yeah. When I actually get proposals, I get unsolicited proposals as well, and I'm always happy to get them. You know, I, I'm always happy to look at proposals, but they need to be short and to the point, you know, so I, I need to know who the artist is, who they are, quick uh, biography, uh, a quick uh, profile example of, say, two or three different works. If there's been a specifically, if an artist has already exhibited publicly somewhere, I need to know about that. And then I need to have a very clear sense of what this proposal is and, and really uh, no more than a paragraph or two on each. Um, also, if you're ever in the business of, of quoting, I think it's, it's very important to, uh, in your proposal, to kind of quote, you, you don't necessarily need to do it in the first proposal, but if you're being asked for this, you know, how much is this? Be very clear on, uh, you know, what your artist fee is uh, and what the production costs are estimated to be, what needs to happen with the shipping, whether you're going to need a technician there to build the thing or whether you'll be there or not. So be, be uh, divided down into different categories. Uh, I'm always happy to see um, a an artist's fee. You know, I, I don't want that to be buried somewhere. I want to know, you know, if I think it's too much, then that can be negotiated. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I would say if you're an artist setting out, um, your time is valuable. Yeah. So, you know, however you want to calculate how much your time is worth, I mean, you could work out how much you get paid in McDonald's for a day, I don't know. But if it's going to take you five days and that's that's your benchmark of what you'd like to be earning, 
make sure you count in all of those days, all of your time uh, developing the proposal. Um, I would also say there's a limit to how much work you should do ahead of time before actually being contracted. Uh, we had a bit of a challenge uh, uh, in Norian in the sense that it's quite hard for us to pay concept development fees. But mostly, if you're at the first stage, I think the concepts that you present shouldn't be too developed you, because you can't over-develop units. It's all of your own time. So you don't need to overly polish the idea. It, it needs to be a strong proposal. What you need to do is then that festival or that organization or that program will then say, actually, we like this. Uh, I, you know, we can you develop this further? We'll pay you this amount. Uh, and that will be the normal way of actually proceeding. Mm -hmm. So keep it simple on a proposal, three pages maximum. If you can do the renders, great, because that's always really important. Uh, show that you understand, look, read what the criteria are. So with, with open calls, it's usually pretty clear what the criteria are. Make sure that you've matched them. Make sure you fill in the form. Well, you know, I mean, we had uh, recently with the Tuwake International Sculpture Symposium, which is happening in Riyadh later this year, we had 408 uh, different uh, applications, but about 10 or 12 of them were, were they hadn't even fi filled the forms in properly, you know, so this is work that tedious as it might be for an artist, you have to do it. Uh, you have to make sure that you put all the requirements in there. Um, Nesma Muhammad asked, uh, I, I also would love to know how do you think the pandemic would affect the art scene? Yeah, I mean, um, I think, well, the pandemic has already affected the arts. Um, one of the things that um, we saw a lot of and we keep seeing of is these kind of things, what we're doing right now is kind of living online, in the, the digital world. And we, uh, I, I really believe that I'm, I'm just hoping we can get back to sort of seeing art in the real world. And, and one of the things we were really, you know, we in Noriad, we were one of the first actually post-pandemic major events. We had very strict conditions in place. It meant that not as many people could see things. You had to book in advance and all of this, which is a bit of a pain, but we did at least go ahead and do it. Um, I think um, it, the pandemic is affecting, it's affecting how people travel uh, and um, how, um, how artists work. They maybe have to work more on their own these days. Uh, and I think overall, it's also affecting the kind of number of events. You know, there are big major events that keep getting postponed. I mean, Vivid Sydney was due to open in about three weeks. It's just been postponed to October and who knows what will happen to that. That's, that's a kind of major, one of the world's largest light art festivals. Yeah. Uh, the Venice Biennale of Architecture was postponed from last year. So, you know, um, and that felt to me uh, I was lucky enough to visit actually a few weeks ago and, you know, a lot of the pavilions were closed. So a lot of countries simply are not able to participate. Mm. So I think um, it's definitely had a, a real impact. Whether or not uh, and how it affects the actual creation and content of our works, I think is a very interesting one. I think uh, we need a little bit longer. I think we've already seen the first sort of pandemic novels coming out and the first pandemic films and things, but I think we need a little bit longer to see what the real impact uh, to art and artistic production is. Yeah. Um, Sara has a question. When thinking in a thematic context and screening artworks, is or should the city's brand be taken into consideration as an important criteria by curator and artist when putting ideas and proposals forward? That's a really interesting question. And the first thing I would say is if you're putting a proposal forward, I, I would ditch any idea of the city brand. Uh, the marketing people, um, we've had one or two kind of talks with marketing people, uh, you know, over the course of organizing this festival. That, that in some cases, one or two members in meetings and things said, oh, could, couldn't this be a bit more on brand? You know, could they work with the Noriad brand colors and things? And we're always absolutely no, this is not what artists do. Artists make their own things. Um, I would say they do respond to place, you know, and understand the place and the feel of the place and where the artwork's going to go. But I think the city branding, that's for the city brand people to do. It's not for the artists to do. You know, uh, the curator, I, I certainly am not like selecting things. So I think, oh, this matches the brand really well. I am selecting things because I'm thinking, look, this, this works with the overall feel and my, my kind of artistic concept of what this festival needs to be. 
but I'm not, it, uh, I, I'm really not, you know, I mean, the video I showed you, this is created by marketing people. So I guess it has, it's been shaped in that way to, to, to look, you know, that's what it's for. Um, but um, uh, yeah, I don't, so I don't think it's a really interesting question, but, and I, and I would say if you're developing your own work, that, that, I mean, it sounds contradictory, you know, look, look at the theme, look at the festival, make sure it's relevant and will work within that festival, the people who are going to see it, look at the site where it could go, make sure it will work in that way. Uh, but make sure you have your own artistic integrity. This is your work and this is your expression. Uh, don't try to kind of feed it too much in to, to the brand. You're, you're not, uh, particularly if you're an artist, you know, you're not a designer here. If yeah. you're a designer, you know, that's, that's a bit different because, you know, we were working with designers for things like our wayfinding and the information booths and things like that. And, you know, that's also very interesting work for designers. In that case, absolutely, you need to look at the overall brand and feel uh, of what the festival is and, and, and what it feels like. But for the artworks, the, no. Yeah, no. Um, so uh, Debjani uh, asks, once an artist is selected, do art fairs provide support to artists to produce or fabricate a piece in their home countries or at the venue? Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, it actually varies. So, uh, you know, we'd accept the proposals and the proposals would include you know what was needed to be done so you know in some cases the artists themselves would come and install and oversee the the fabrication process some works were made in Riyadh in fact more were made than would have been without the pandemic which is perhaps a good thing um, some artists uh, have only got their own technicians that they work with and they want those artists particularly the more experienced artists you know they only want particular technicians who really understand their work who will come and help to realize uh, that that piece if we're commissioning new artworks then um, the cost of fabrication was uh, covered by the festival the cost of shipping and the fee to the artist as well um, and it's actually quite nice because the artist still gets to own the piece at the end uh, you know, so it's, it's uh, if you're commissioned and you get a new artwork and in some cases we're, we're always looking at kind of the future life for things. I mean, the, the Flynn Talbot work that I showed you yeah. um, in the London Design Biennale, that was actually acquired by a museum in Australia. So it's now part of the museum collection, which was really great to, to have that happen. Um, you know, we've been talking to some uh, institutions about possible kind of like exhibiting um, again, uh, artworks and so on, but they revert to the ownership of the of the artist at the, at the yeah. end of the process. Yeah, uh, Zia has a question. How was your experience working with an emerging artist for large scale artwork? Well, I mean, um, uh, the uh, we had some really interesting proposals from emerging artists, and some of them were not quite ready for what we actually needed. Um, they, uh, in some cases, it's. Uh, it's better for an artist to work at a smaller scale uh, yeah. for, for longer. But, you know, I think one of the things we do do as a festival, I think you kind of have a responsibility to support younger artists as well, or, or emerging artists, should we say, not, not necessarily younger, but kind of, you know, emerging career artists. And in some cases, um, it's, um, it's, uh, it's good for um, an artist to sort of take on a project that pushes them a bit and so you know one of the beauties of a, a large festival like this is sometimes there's a budget available that might not have been available previously to that artist and so they can uh, scale up their work or scale up doesn't necessarily mean making it literally bigger you know it can mean being more ambitious in what they're trying to do in one way in one way or another um, uh, Behnoush has a question. I would like to know what you would do differently in respect of curatorial process, site, and artist selection, considering pandemic experiences. Um, well, that's uh, interesting to think about. I mean, I, I don't know whether I would do that much differently. Um, I think, you know, we had a lot of uh, local artists uh, working with us anyway. And obviously the great thing about that is they, they're in Riyadh, you know, so we can work with them. So I think that, you know, that is something that would continue. That was perhaps partly affected by the pandemic. Um, I think um, uh, artist selection, I think, um, I, I don't know really how much it was affected by the pandemic, to be honest, the actual artist selection. I mean, it wasn't 
really any any work where we said look oh, we can't do this because of the pandemic um so uh you know if there's another wave of the pandemic then i guess you know i mean one or two works we actually modified i mean there was one piece uh, by squid soup a british design group that involves these kind of like hanging uh, lights and and that was really initially intended to be touched and people would move amongst it like in a forest or pushing apart the trees and uh, the health and safety looked at it and they said oh we can't have people touching it and i, I thought actually they were being a little bit over the top to be mm -hmm. honest uh, but we in the end we created a pathway through and the artist was fine with that so you know that was a artwork that was actually modified due to the pandemic but yeah. the selection of it it didn't stop us selecting it you know um and so i think in some cases it was a case of having to kind of push back against because uh, you know against the health and safety because you don't you know there's there's um you know you can you can make something 100 percent safe but you know, if it's already safer than say going to the cinema, then yeah. you know I think the the thing there's a limit to how much you can modify or or also kind of uh, you know uh, pre prevent you you selecting works because you're worried about the impact of COVID. I, I, I tried for that not to be to be a consideration. Um, shall we see if there is one more question because we're approaching eight thirty and we need to end? Is there anything else, to, uh, Sumi? Would you want to share? Or? Well, I was just looking at the uh, those two other questions about the artists getting paid for the work. So um, yeah. there was good. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, every artist that participates uh, is paid. Uh, they have a contract. Um, they're paid. Their travel is paid, and and the uh, the artwork itself is paid for. Uh, so. Um, and um, I, I, yes, I said that artists in a proposal need to be clear about the fees and the costs of the piece, basically. You yeah. know, this is something that if I get a proposal, say, for some big sculpture made out of light, you know, I, I don't want to then have to go away and work out how much that steel structure is going to cost and how much the bulbs are going to cost and this and that. I need, I need the artists to have included that in the proposal, but I also need them to be clear that they have a fee, you know, and this is my fee for this work um yeah. so um uh so that's that's what i was saying if you're if you're ever proposing something you know it's it's good to you can put a range in for example you know you can put the the, the range of what you think the production costs will be and you could also put the range for your own fee you know which would be like you know look if it's going to go be scaled to this and this is approximately what my fee will be depending on the on what we're actually working on and uh you know, then I think the, uh, you know, production companies were, or the contractor who's, you know, who, the, who's actually going to be contracting you would, would probably want to negotiate, but it's, it's much easier for, for me as an artistic director and curator to be really clear on what this thing is going to cost. Hmm. I mean, it's a great uh, note to end at in terms of like artist fees and making sure that artists are getting paid, because I think uh, as artists, we tend to forget about this or we can kind of join it with the production. And I think it's very essential that we highlight that artists need to be paid in some way. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that, um, you know, I think uh, uh, sometimes people forget that. I think people who are not involved in the art world, they kind of think that you all do it for free. It's just like, a, you, know, yeah. they, they, you know, you don't expect a plumber to come around your house and fix your pipes and then not get paid. But, you know, an artist, sometimes people think that an artist will just, you know, so I'm I'm very conscious of that, and sometimes I'm in a I'm unfortunately in a position where I'm having to ask for certain things, and I'm not paying for them, but I'm, I'm I, I want that to be kind of included later. You know, so yeah. if I'm saying, look, please send me a render and so on, you know, I'm I'm yeah. trying to do it on the basis of I think we're going to be selecting and commissioning this artist, and then you know your fee should include the work that you've done as well in that initial proposal. If it's taking you five days of your time to get these proposals together and the calculations and that. Put it in your fee for the final for the final work. You know, yeah. I think it's it's really really important. Uh, Thank you so much, Sumantra. It was it was inspiring. It was great to have this discussion. Uh, thank you for joining us for this Ashki lecture. Uh, we have learned so much. Definitely. For more information on Nuriyad, please visit nuriyad.sa. For more information on Tashkil, follow us on at Tashkil Studio and at Tashkil.org. Uh, this lecture is going to be posted online, so just follow us in, on Tashkil to 
watch this again. And again, uh, to me, this was great. Uh, I hope we continue doing more of these, uh, maybe in in another capacity with Tashkil. Well, it's been a real pleasure. So thank, thank you so much. And uh, I do love what you're doing there at Tashkil, by the way. So uh, uh, yeah, I hope to visit as soon as I can get over there again. I'll come, come on another Yes, day. please do. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you. Thanks for joining. Thank you.